their story. Lost. Inside a stormy vacuum. Hundreds of years. Without a trace. No mention. In our books. In our movies. Their bravery. And service. Only uniquely remembered. Sergeant Matthew Colgan, of the British 18th Hussars Regiment, wrote the following witnessed observation, in the account of his service, during the Battle of Waterloo. We had not been many minutes in this position, when the French guns opened upon us, but they were harmless, owing to the manner, the General, Sir H. Vivian, who had taken up his position with his staff, and Black Trumpeter, maneuvered us, having no further effect than their shots dashing the earth in our faces, some falling short, and others, overreaching us. Historically, the black soldiers of the past had only their service papers and awarded medals to show as evidence of them fighting in campaigns while in the British military. Witness accounts that would observe them in action, are almost unheard of. Related to Napoleonic battles, Sergeant Colgan's observation, is one of these exceptionally rare recorded sightings. An ongoing comprehensive study of the first black soldiers recruited into the British Army, is being conducted by John D. Ellis. For over 20 years, he has been researching the presence of black soldiers, in military service during the 18th and 19th centuries. And has so far identified an astounding total of approximately 500 individuals. In his overview, he writes. By the early 19th century. The practice of employing black soldiers was widespread in the British Army. Most of the cavalry regiments included them, as did all of the household cavalry regiments. And in the line infantry, over 100 regiments are known to have employed West Indian-born black soldiers, at some point in the early 19th century. This figure excludes those black soldiers born elsewhere. Black soldiers originated from all the established regions of the African diaspora, such as North America, and the East and West Indies. In fewer numbers, they came from Nova Scotia, Ireland, and England. Asian and Euro-Asian, or Anglo-Indian soldiers, born in the East Indies, that is to say, modern India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, were also referred to as being black. In the 18th and 19th centuries, it was common for British, and its Irish regiments, to recruit black males to serve as enlisted military musicians. The fashion for Turkish music, and the belief in the natural propensity for music for black people, resulted in most British regiments employing black musicians to play percussion instruments, such as cymbals, tambourines, and drums, in addition to trumpets and bugles. This appears to have coincided with an increase in the size of the black population in Britain, and in the size of the British Army, during the American War of Independence and Napoleonic campaigns. The size of the black population almost certainly being influenced by British involvement. In areas of the African diaspora, trade, and, the transatlantic slave trade. Employed, as symbols of regimental opulence and prestige. For example, the more black military musicians, the higher the status of the regiment. And in a similar manner to black servants, they were initially enlisted, by high status regiments. Ellis also notes two historical newspaper references proving large numbers of black trumpeters serving in the British 4th Dragoons. One source originates from the December 3, 1803 edition of the Ipswich Journal. The story is an account of the regiment's eight black trumpeters seen together administering corporal punishment, upon four court-martialed dragoons. The second account appears in the London General Evening Post. It reported on an impressive spectacle of ten of the 4th Dragoon's black bandsmen, playing military music on their kettle drums, during a large military parade, before the Prince Regent, the Prince of Wales, at Newmarket Hill, near Brighton, in England, on 12 August, 1805. The artillery took the lead, and were followed, in open column, by the 4th Cavalry, or Queen's Own Regiment. As soon as the 1st Division passed the Prince, 
the ten black trumpeters with their kettle drums, wheeled to the left, and took post opposite to his royal highness, and continued playing martial airs, until the whole regiment passed, and then gave way, to the trumpeters of the Inskillen, who wheeled in like manner. By 1800, the United States had a black population of 1 million people, and well over 200,000 were on the tiny island of Jamaica. On the entire European continent, the numbers of blacks and mulattoes were much less in proportion to the numbers of whites. Britain's black population climbed to 15,000 by 1780. France and the Netherlands each incorporated several thousand black residents. Many times more were in Spain and Portugal, while hundreds were scattered from Germany to Russia. Whereas the blacks in the United States and West Indies were mostly locked into the savage and brutal slavery systems, those blacks in Europe at the same time, found themselves living in diversified roles, though still repressed in racially prejudiced systems. By the start of the 19th century, Europe's black and mulatto population, included page boys, maids, servants, and cooks, street buskers, and crippled ex-soldiers who became beggars, war veterans and sailors, household musicians, freed slaves who became socially notorious, scholars, writers, and abolitionists. Some biracial children were fortunate enough to be accepted into the local aristocracy, and could live in high-class comfort, with social privileges. But for most, there were racist restrictions that still impeded their full equality. Many black men, whether free, or slave fugitives, or who were formerly prisoners of war, also volunteered to be soldiers. And in rare instances, there were both, talented and, rarely mentioned, black generals, as was to be first seen in France, and Russia. Black soldiers could be found in Napoleonic armies across Europe being more commonly employed, as band musicians in French infantry and cavalry regiments, including the elite imperial guard. They were also in various armies of nations and states that were allied to Napoleon. During the Napoleonic Wars, British military servicemen records included references to details of their appearances. For some recruited soldiers in the ranks, written notes would mention, black, dark, or tawny complexion, and having woolly hair. Other skin colors noted, such as, brown and dark, were also frequently used, to describe complexions of weather-beaten or darker-skinned British, Irish, and European soldiers. For research purposes, this sometimes makes identifying black soldiers problematic. In addition, according to John Ellis, Recruits were sought from the black population, resident in England and Ireland. The 18th was a fashionable regiment, therefore having black military musicians would have been normal, although by the early 1800s, most regiments, fashionable or otherwise, had black soldiers in them. The British Army of the period, made no distinction between soldiers of African or Asian origin, referring to them as either, black, or, of color. The presence of most soldiers in the British Army during the Napoleonic Wars, passed unnoticed, except for being mentioned by rank and name, in their regiment's quarterly muster books and pay lists. When used alongside civilian records, newspapers and parish registers, a fascinating portrait emerges of the men who served in the 18th Hussars. Charles Brown, from Charleston in the United States, was the first black soldier known to have served in the British 18th Hussars Cavalry Regiment. He was enlisted in the regiment in 1799, which prior to 1807, was formerly known as the 18th Dragoons Regiment.
The British 18th Hussars, was one of the four original British Light Dragoon Cavalry Regiments, which between 1806 to 1808, were Britain's first Napoleonic cavalry, that were redesignated as Hussar Regiments. The traditional Hussar uniform style was adopted, which included the fur busby cap. As well, the Hussars' light horse scouting methods were used during military operations. Colonel Richard Hussey Vivian, commanded, the 7th Hussars, at this time. Vivian first served in the British Army in 1793, and became a captain in the 28th Foot. In 1798, he joined the 7th Light Dragoons, and eventually became its lieutenant colonel. In 1807, his regiment was one of the four Light Dragoon regiments, that became Hussars. According to John Ellis, at least two black soldiers can be identified, in both the 28th Foot, and the 7th Hussars. These were, John Peters in the 28th Foot, between 1795 and 1800, and Thomas Jenkins, in the 7th Hussars, between 1803 and 1825. In the winter of 1808 to 1809, four of these British Hussar regiments, the 7th, the 10th, the 15th, and the 18th, were campaigning in northern Spain fighting under Sir John Moore, as his British army conducted its epic and brutal fighting retreat, to escape, a determined pursuing French army, led by Napoleon Bonaparte. These new Hussar regiments achieved an impressive fighting record, whenever in combat against the French cavalry, such as their clashes at, Sargon, and, Benevente. In January, 1809, the British Army was successfully evacuated by the Royal Navy, at the sea town of Coruna. The Hussar regiments, were brought back to England, but without most of their horses. The 18th Hussars was stationed in Britain, for the next three years. During this time, James Goodwin, joined the 18th Hussars. Colonel Vivian and his 7th Hussars, as well as the 18th, were landed back in Spain in the summer of 1813 to once again fight the French. The British Hussar regiments fought with distinction, participating in the Duke of Wellington's decisive victories in the latter years of the Peninsula War in Spain, and during the 1814 invasion into southern France. Around this time, Colonel Vivian was appointed to command two different light cavalry brigades, one of which included, Trumpeter Goodwin and the 18th Hussars. Vivian proved to be an intrepid cavalry commander, and was always very popular with troops of the regiments he led. Vivian was seriously wounded during combat in 1814, but he did recover, and was promoted to the rank of Major General at the start of 1815. In April of 1814, Napoleon Bonaparte, was finally overwhelmed, by the armies of the European Sixth Coalition, with the defeat forcing him into exile, on the island of Elba. But, less than a year later, war was yet again declared against Napoleon, in the spring of 1815, following his daring escape from exile, and subsequent seizure of power in France. The leaders of Europe, formed a new alliance, the Seventh Coalition, and planned to invade France with several armies consisting of over 600,000 troops, by July of 1815. The Duke of Wellington, was in command of his own army of the Low Countries, which was stationed in Belgium. In preparation for the summer invasion, the army slowly increased its strength. Major General, Richard Hussey Vivian, was appointed to command the British 6th Cavalry Brigade. The brigade was initially composed of, the British 7th, 10th, and, 18th Hussar Regiments. Just before the start of the Waterloo campaign, the 7th Hussars Regiment, was transferred to General Grant's Light Cavalry Brigade, and the 1st King's German Legion Hussars, replaced them in General Vivian's Brigade. Trumpeter Goodwin, was with the British 18th Hussars, when it left Britain in April, to join Wellington's army in Belgium. It assembled with the rest of Vivian's Brigade, southwest of Brussels, around the area of Grandmont. Early in the morning of June 15, 1815, Napoleon suddenly started the war, by invading southern Belgium, with a powerful French army. His intention was to knock out the two coalition armies, stationed in Belgium. That of Wellington, and the Prussian army, of Field Marshal Blucher. If successful, Napoleon could possibly convince the coalition leaders, to discuss peace. Between June 15 and 17, 
Napoleon's army fought his two enemies, in a series of skirmishes, fighting retreats, and two major battles at Likni, with a victory against the Prussians, and at Quatre Bras, in a setback loss against the Anglo-Allied army. The strategic result initially kept the two Allied armies separated, and obliged both to retreat back towards the Belgian capital of Brussels. Napoleon's pursuit was stopped on June 18, when his enemies decided to turn around and fight him, along a ridge of high ground, several miles south of the village of Waterloo. John Ellis, has discovered, that all of the British regiments, in Major General Vivian's brigade, had black soldiers. However, in his research, Ellis, has not found any in the King's German Legion Hussars. But, he did find one, in an infantry regiment of the King's German Legion. The research of John Ellis, identifies at least nine known black soldiers serving in the British Army, at the Battle of Waterloo. In all likelihood, across all the armies fighting in the battle, there were possibly scores more black soldiers present on that day, who will never be found recorded in historical documentation. The most familiar names, of these almost invisible soldiers, found on record, are George Rose, William Afflick, and James Goodwin. Born in Jamaica, George Rose, and started off as an 18-year-old recruit in the British 73rd Foot Infantry Regiment in 1809. He saw action, in the Flanders Campaign. His battalion was part of the 4th British Infantry Brigade during the Waterloo Campaign. Though wounded at the Battle of Waterloo, Rose survived, and finished his army career in 1837, as a sergeant in the 42nd Highlanders. William Afflick, was born in St Kitts in 1781, and had a long military career in the British Army. While in the 10th Hussars Cavalry Regiment, he served as a trumpeter, and saw action in the Peninsular War, from 1808 to 1809, under Sir John Moore's command, and then with Wellington's army, up to its invasion of France. He was again in the thick of combat, with the regiment during the Waterloo Campaign. At the Battle of Waterloo, Afflick, and the 10th British Hussars Regiment, was in General Vivian's, British 6th Cavalry Brigade. Also serving in the same brigade, was James Goodwin. He was born in 1789, in Barbados, a British colony in the Caribbean. How he arrived in Sussex, England, is unknown, but it was there he signed up with the British 18th Hussars, in 1809. Goodwin was a private who served in the regimental band, and was promoted to trumpeter in 1812, and thereafter, spent his whole service in that role. On enlistment, he was described as, 5 feet 8 and a half inches tall, and with a black complexion. Goodwin's career in the British cavalry lasted from 1809 to 1841, ending with his service in the 4th British Dragoons, to which he had transferred in 1821. Goodwin's role as a cavalry trumpeter, was not one of simply playing rousing military tunes on occasion, while flamboyantly attired in a colourful regimental band uniform, typical of the era. In camps and barracks, the trumpeters and buglers were essential in maintaining the routines of military discipline. In battle, the cavalry trumpeters' duties determined life and death for their fellow troopers. During close combat cavalry action, the commanders of cavalry brigades, regiments, and squadrons, needed to make quick decisions, and give instant orders, such as, charge, rally, and retreat. The loud calls of bugles and trumpets were of paramount importance, to immediately sound out a commander's orders. As such, trumpeters had to stay within close proximity of their officers, while on duty, during campaigns and battles. A trumpeter was required to be brave and self-composed. Although defenseless, while sounding out calls on his trumpet, all trumpeters were armed with swords, and would be ready to fight to the death, to protect himself. Or his comrades. It's important to note that in this next part of our presentation, 
no records have yet been found that name the black orderly trumpeter, spotted by Sergeant Colgan, riding alongside Major General Vivian at Waterloo, as being, trumpeter James Goodwin. Nor do his military records indicate he had that specific role. However, researcher John Ellis, has firmly concluded, from the strongest documented evidence available, that the veteran trooper, Goodwin, must certainly have been the black trumpeter, observed by Colgan. Goodwin had served in Colonel Vivian's brigade in 1814. Being selected by Vivian to act as his brigade's orderly trumpeter, Goodwin had surely proven himself to be exceptionally reliable during combat, and displayed utmost excellence as a professional soldier. Ellis points out in his research, that Goodwin was described as a good and efficient soldier, seldom in hospital, trustworthy, and sober. I woke up just before daybreak, on this Sunday morning, of the 18th of June. The tremendous rain, which had poured down heavily, most of yesterday, and throughout the night, was now just to drizzle. The ground beneath us, was like a muddy lake. For miles around, in the camps of the two armies, there were hundreds of trumpeters, who, like me, were now sounding calls, to wake up, tens of thousands of sleeping soldiers. Horses were fed, rain-soaked clothes were dried, and hungry soldiers, ate whatever food, they were lucky enough to share, or find, in the nearby empty farms. Some of us, like me, may do with any Russians we already had, after a 40-mile march, to meet the enemy, two days ago, and then, our long fighting retreat, much of yesterday, to where we are now. My biscuits and porridge of oats, we called stir about, I had to imagine as a delicious meal. I was appointed to act as, General Vivian's, orderly trumpeter, for our 6th Cavalry Brigade, which had, three Hussar regiments. The British 10th, and 18th Hussars, and the 1st King's German Legion, Hussars. Altogether, we numbered about 1,600 troopers. Most of us were veterans, from the previous campaigns, in Spain, and France. We were posted, on our army's extreme left flank. Our orders were clear. The brigade was to hold its position, at all costs, so that we would be first in our army, to greet, and unify, with the army of our Prussian allies, who we expected to join us in the battle, sometime in the afternoon. Since I was part of the brigade orderly staff, I naturally would accompany them at all times. General Vivian's staff of orderlies included Brigade Major Captain Thomas Harris and two aide de camps, Captain Keane, who was related to the general's wife, and Lieutenant Fitzroy. The general had a German orderly who followed us too. I gave assistance with my trumpet calls in the rapid deployment of our brigade's three Hussar regiments, while our commanders moved them into their battle positions on a flat plain of fields to the north of the long and narrow Owen Road that stretched east to west across our army's front. Our popular general was mounted on a lovely, creamy white horse of the 10th Hussars. His right arm was in a sling, as it was not fully recovered from the bullet wound he suffered during a skirmish a year earlier in France. General Vivian ordered out patrols to some nearby farms and hamlets, one mile south of us, which were occupied by a brigade of our armies, Nasse German infantry. He posted another Hussar detachment at the town of Owen, about a mile east of us, to watch for and give news of the expected Prussians. Under the cloudy early morning sky, we looked west to view our army position which stretched for three miles, far over, to the edge of our right flank. The Brussels Highway, cut through the center of our army, which was positioned, upon, and around, the big hill, of Monsanchon. At around ten o'clock, our army and the bigger French army, were nearly ready for battle. We heard the church bells from nearby towns. Ordinary people were going to their Sunday masses as normal. But, their choirs and sermons, would be interrupted by our battle's chorus of explosions, sung from the mouths of hundreds of cannon barrels. From the French side, we heard their regiments, cry out, with loud cheers in unison, to their commander, Napoleon, over and over. V. Flamperia, 
V. Flame Piria. I could hear the faint echoes of the French military bands playing, drifting across the valley. Boney's French military was, as always, quite loud, colorful, and dramatic. Just before noon, the battle started on our right flank, where our army defended an outpost protected by some woods. An hour or so later, the conflict drew closer to us. The French made an impressive display, as they swiftly set up a great battery position, of 60 or 70 cannons, to the front of their center. At one o'clock, those guns opened an unforgettable cannonade, that thundered loudly across the valley, and it was dropping deadly cannon balls and exploding shells, all along our army positions. Our general was ready for this event. He responded, to the French storm of iron shots, as he did during the Peninsula campaign. Myself and the star orderlies followed General Vivian, as he rode across the brigade position, and carefully sheltered the Hussar regiments, behind the hill crests and hedges. Now our Hussars, were protected, from most of the enemy shots, that did fall near us. The cannonballs, either flew over our heads, or stopped into the muddy ground, in front of our troopers. These close misses of French shots, only damaged us, by splashing up sprays of mud, all over our already dirty uniforms. When the French battery stopped firing, I saw around 15,000 enemy infantry, formed up in massive columns, opposite our entire left flank. The French phalanxes crossed the valley, and attacked our own weaker line of defending battalions, and were pushing them back from the ridge line. Just then, I was relieved to see our two brigades of British heavy cavalry dragoons charge into the French columns, and scatter them completely in ten minutes. I distinctly saw the Scots Greys troopers, mounted on magnificent white and grey horses, recklessly charge forward alone, into the French main position. If the Union Cavalry Brigade are trumpeters and officers, trying to recall them, such desperate efforts were ignored. The brave fools were slaughtered by the perfectly led French counter-attack of their swift lances and armored cuirassiers. Only a brave advance into the valley by a brigade of our Dutch-Belgian light force and the same move by the British dragoons in the light brigade next to ours prevented a complete annihilation of our two shattered British heavy cavalry brigades. General Vivian had me call out with my trumpet to the brigade to also advance in support, but we stopped midway as we were coming from too far to help, well before the massacre was over. The heavy dragoons counter-attack had completely destroyed the massive French attack and took thousands of prisoners that the French great battery had plunged into so recklessly rolled back into action soon after the sad event. For the next two hours, the battlefield on our flank was mostly quiet. Only a few French cannon shots still fell about our brigade. In the farms and hamlets below us, the Nassau defenders successfully stopped several weak French infantry attacks. General Vivian and our outposts kept watch into the distance to our left. We could see the long columns of tens of thousands of Prussian troops marching closer to the battlefield. Around three o'clock, they passed into a large woods, a mile or so, southeast of us. They exited its western tree line at around half past four in battle formations. The Prussians furiously attacked a small French corps that we observed had been sent to block them. Now seeing the size of the Prussian columns stretching for miles along the road, far to the east, it seemed only a question of how soon could they overwhelm the French opposing them. At this same time, we gazed to our right, observing the growing clouds of gun smoke in the center of our army, where furious action was taking place. From our own safer position, we witnessed a spectacular event lasting the next two hours, during which 10,000 or more French cavalrymen surged up and over the slopes of Mont Saint Hill. It seemed a dozen of these big charges were launched all together, and each one was beaten back by our troops. A great tower of black smoke rose from our outpost on the right flank, 
shrouding the area with darkness. A procession of British and Prussian officers, acting as army liaisons, galloped past our brigade in both directions much more frequently. Both of our armies were finally preparing to unite. One of those staff officers, Colonel Gallancy, was a good friend of General Vivian. He spotted the general, and rode up to our party of orderlies, to give a sobering account of the worsening crisis facing our army center. Gallancy, told the general, that one of our two strong points, where the black smoke came from, was almost surrounded. And the other outpost, in our center, which was a big farmhouse, was certainly ready to fall to the French, despite the heroics, of some gallant Germans defenders inside the place. When asked about the French cavalry attacks, Gallancy, said, the big hill was still in our possession, but the French charges had nearly destroyed all of our cavalry brigades as they were used in all too many counter-attacks to drive away the masses of French horsemen. He added that, he last saw French cannons were on the hill's plateau, pouring grape and cannonballs, into our shrinking infantry squares, and there was a great suffering and terrible losses among the young recruits in the German brigades, positioned in the centre. Delancey said, he seen many thousands of our soldiers leaving the battlefield, wounded or not. He informed us that General Picton, of the fighting 5th Highland Division, General Ponsonby, of the Union Heavy Dragoons Brigade, and Colonel Hamilton, of the Scots Greys, were all killed, during the earlier big French infantry attack. Delancey added, that for the sake of our army, Ninth Order Prussians needed to come fast, and in the meantime, our centre desperately needed fresh cavalry support. Then he bid the general, a grave farewell, and he rode off towards the oncoming Prussian columns. Ten minutes later, a plump-looking Colonel Mouflin, a Prussian liaison staff officer, who we already knew was acting with Lord Wellington's staff, rode up to us, and made the same plea, urging our general, to move our cavalry, over to our hard-pressed centre. But, our general, could not oblige, as our brigade had no orders, to leave our crucial position. And, it was well known, by the veteran British commanders of the Peninsula campaigns, to dare not disobey, strict orders to hold a position, given by Lord Wellington. By six o'clock, we could see the Prussian attack, pushing ahead, with many more of their troops still exiting the woods. The French defenders slowly yielded ground, in a fighting retreat, for over a mile, back towards a big village, that was behind the French right flank. It was within half a mile of the Brussels Highway, in the French centre. The French army would lose the battle, if the Prussians could capture the village, and if our army stood its own ground. A Prussian brigade, showed themselves closer to our position, coming up from southeast of the farms defended by the NASA soldiers. This strong appearance of friendly troops, now secured our flank. General Vivian, had just received a new message from Captain Seymour, a messenger sent by the Earl of Uxbridge, urging our brigade to move to the army center. Uxbridge, was in command of all the cavalry in our army. Just then, our staff party saw many troops appear to our east, at Oain village. General Vivian sent Captain Seymour to report back on those spotted columns. We soon found out that these were the advance guard of General Z-10's Prussian 1st Corps, that was now moving into, Oain. At first, they seemed to march south, towards their main body, which was starting their attack at the big village, in the French rear area. But, fortunately for us, they resumed their march back towards our own army's flank, to reinforce us directly. When Z-10's leading Prussian cavalry brigade passed south of us, and we felt much relieved, General Vivian now decided, that our brigade had completed its mission to be joined by the Prussians. He gave orders for the brigade to move where it was now most needed. I was ordered, to sound out trumpet calls, that turned our brigade, facing right flank, and began moving towards the army center. It was about 6.30, when our brigade started off on a two-mile march, behind our front lines, westward. We hoped, our arrival would not be too late. Nearing our destination, the Earl of Exbridge himself, 
spotted our brigade's movement, and rode up to us. He looked much relieved to see our much wanted appearance. Axbridge pointed our brigade to move further west, crossing over the Brussels Highway and taking up the second line on the rear slope of Minsant Shun Hill. While crossing the highway, we passed by the gatekeeper of this hall, which was the battalion square of the 27th foot. It was getting chopped to pieces, while exposed on high ground, at the crossroads in our center. Half of the men in that square, lay dead or wounded from close range firing, of French cannons, and their skirmishers shooting from a high mound. What a difference it was here, in the middle of the battlefield. Earlier in the day, our brigade in its far away position, stood in clean air and open fields, and we could hide from enemy cannon fire. But here, we had marched into an inferno, filled with smoke, gunshots, destruction, and death, all around. As we crossed the highway, we were completely exposed, to a buzzing storm of French bullets, rushing cannon balls, and the bursts of exploding shells. Our general, soon came across another of his friends, Lord Somerset, commander of the Household Guards Cavalry Brigade. He was now in charge, of the remnants of the Union Brigade too, also formed in our army's center. When General Vivian, asked him, where is your brigade? Lord Somerset, slowly gestured at the two hundred troopers, lined up behind him. Here, he said. Then he pointed to the ground around them, where many of their comrades lay dead. They were all that now remained, from our two British heavy cavalry brigades, that had started the battle only six hours earlier, with a combined strength of over two thousand horsemen. Our brigade took up its place behind the hill. We relieved Somerset's exhausted heavy cavalry survivors, who passed through our ranks, to the rear. Around us, the situation was fearful, among all our remaining infantry squares and cavalry regiments. They had lost half their original numbers, and our artillery brigades ahead of them, were mostly silenced. They were mutterings in our brigade's ranks, each sharing the same dreaded thought. Were we here? to cover an imminent retreat of our army. General Vivian, deployed our Hussar regiments, in a long line. Our brigade gave confidence, to the decimated infantry squares of Nassirs, who were retiring from the front line ahead of us. We could barely see them, like ghosts among the clouds of gun smoke everywhere. These Germans were mostly just boys, trying to outlive this terrifying battle. Their older veteran officers, use much shouting, shoving, and cursing, to keep these young lads from falling back further. The German commander's efforts, together with those of General Vivian, and our officers, cheering encouragement to them, were successful in getting the dark green uniformed infantry brigade, to turn around and advance back to their former positions once more. The young Netherlands army commander, the Prince of Orange, was being carried past us by his staff past the remnants of some regiments of Dutch and Belgian cavalry, standing close by us. The prince had a bad wound. He must have been rallying the wavering German troops in our front. One can only wonder, why in that moment, the French did not take advantage, of our desperate situation in the center, and overwhelm us with their reserves. Our brigade, had earlier seen the Prussians were in action, so we guessed, that though far away, they had something to do with our salvation, during this moment of crisis. More improved for us. General Van der Leer, whose brigade was next to ours earlier in the day, on the left flank, now showed themselves, and deployed on our right flank. Then, several battalions of black uniformed Brunswick infantry, came into the line, ahead on our right. We saw Lord Wellington, riding fearlessly along the front line. No doubt, he took full advantage, of the recent pause in the French attacks, to shift all available reinforcements to defend the hill. All our infantry battalions, ahead of us, were ordered, to change from their squares, into lines that would fall that steep. The French cavalry, was no longer a threat. It was close to half past seven and the red sun was starting to set. We could sense, a big finale in the battle, was upon us.
From our position, just a few hundred yards behind the summit of the hill, we heard the familiar rub-a-dub-dub sounds of many French drums sounding in the valley beyond. The drum beats were coming closer each minute, meaning a large French infantry attack was ascending the hill. The soldiers were cheering out loud, while our own troops waited for them in complete silence. Within 10 minutes, fighting broke out to our front, where the German infantry became engaged in a tremendous firefight. Slowly the remains of their brigades retreated back towards us, in great confusion. Our squadrons closed up our lines, to prevent any of those infantry moving through us. The Nassas eventually rallied and got back into the fight. We saw a brigade of British infantry, ahead to our right on the plateau, also falling back, to take shelter behind a sunken lane. There, they reorganized themselves, and began to fire back at their attackers, appearing determined to hold out to the last man. The drifting thick gun smoke cleared in some places, allowing us to see the enemy infantry now appearing on the ridge, only a few hundred yards ahead. We saw they looked like giants, wearing tall fur bonnets on their heads. These were the French Imperial Guards. They marched with such precision, standing out even larger, in their long, dark blue greatcoats, and white cross belts. Though many in their ranks were felled in the firefight, they quickly closed the gaps in their lines. Suddenly, there was a great noise near our right flank. A brigade of Dutch-Belgian infantry battalion columns charged to meet the Imperial Guards. They had a horse artillery battery that enlimbered ahead of them and at point-blank range, its cannons let loose with several salvos of destructive canister shots straight into the Imperial Guards. Entire platoons of Frenchmen were dropped by each blast. The surviving enemy infantry could not withstand the close-range cannon fire, nor the waves of thousands of cheering Dutch-Belgian masses of infantry charging towards them with bayonets ready. To escape complete annihilation, the French guardsmen turned about and fled down the hill, chased by our green and blue-coated infantry, many of whom put their shakos on muskets raised high. But, the fight for the hill was not finished. Several hundred yards west of the plateau, we heard the start of even more intense infantry volley exchanges. From where our brigade stood, the hill summit blocked our view of the flash. We knew there was a brigade of our British foot guards, and our light infantry brigade, defending that area. After a few minutes, the sounds of musketry ended, and then there were very loud British cheers of, hurrah. But soon even more heavier firefights resumed in that area, and much fiercer than before. We could not see the chaotic action, but the sound of it gradually neared us, to just beyond the slope ahead. Then our whole front line of infantry moved forward to the crest. The sound of battle was now most deafening. I saw the Duke riding along the skyline, calling out orders in a cool manner to our commanders near to him. They were the few left of his staff officers, still following him. Somehow, in the storm of bullets flying all about, the Duke remained unharmed. It must have been 8 o'clock, as the sun was now dropping below the smoke-filled skyline. In the fading evening light, one of Lord Wellington's messengers rode up to our general, and passed on the orders for him, to attack the French, by moving our brigade, around the right side of the masses of infantry that were locked in combat, along the hill crest ahead of us. General Vivian instructed me to sound the call, that faced our brigade to the right flank, and we then trotted in a long column, led by the 10th Hussars, moving west. We passed by Vandelay's light cavalry regiments on our right, who cheered us on. And likewise, on our left, the British Brigade of Foot Guards, also shouted out to us with encouragement. Moments later, when General Vivian saw our column's lead squadron, not turning south, as instructed, at the open space leading towards the valley below, he yelled out. Damn! The general then grumbled loudly at the stray half-squadron, which had almost misled our column, to go towards the enemy, not away from it. Our general galloped ahead, 
and personally corrected the advance, and turned our column to the left and proceeded into the intended gap of space, which allowed us to move unobstructed into the valley. Having done so, we also cleared the gun smoke on the hill, and we had an open view of the French army, which was now falling apart everywhere beyond us. The general, had me call out, on my trumpet, the brigade's next actions, which I needed to do loudly, because of so much battle noise everywhere. The 10th Hussars, were formed up as our front line, and the 18th Hussars, lined up behind them. Our German Hussars were positioned behind in reserve. To our left, the survivors of the French Imperial Guard attack had been chased down into the valley by our infantry, and past the big farmhouse in front of our center, which our infantry swarmed all around to take back from the French trapped inside. Behind us, I saw a British infantry brigade in a long line, that had marched right across our hill's forward slope, sweeping away the last remaining enemy back into the valley. On the high ground, ahead of the French main position, were several well-formed Imperial Guard battalion squares, and beside them were some artillery batteries, and many groups of their cuirassiers and lancers. A messenger from Lord Wellington, advised General Vivian, not to attack the Imperial Guard squares, unless he felt confident to do so. The General sent back a reply to the Duke, expressing his intention, to attack and drive away the French cavalry, so that they would be no threat, to our infantry now advancing across the valley. General Vivian, ordered the 10th Hussars, to charge against the French cavalry. The attack was thoroughly successful, and overran the enemy. The general had me sound the rally, to halt and reform our 10th Hussars. The general, and our group of orderlies, were on our way back to order forward the 18th Hussars, when a French cuirassier suddenly appeared among us, and quickly attacked General Vivian. In that instant, the general could only barely defend himself, as his injured right hand, still in a sling, was holding his horse reins. He fought back with his left arm, thrusting his sword at the Frenchman's neck, whereupon the general's little German orderly, intervened and cut down the French assailant. On our way to the 18th Hussars, we looked up the hill, and were thrilled to see so much of our army's infantry and cavalry advancing down the slope, and across the valley to pursue the French. Our general implored the 18th Hussars, to attack some nearby groups of French cavalry and artillery, that were beside two remaining Imperial Guard squares on the ridge ahead. General Vivian shouted, Uncooked, my lad! You are now for a fellow man! The sergeant of the 18th loudly replied, Yes, General, to hell, if you will lead us. Then I sounded the charge, and the 18th Hussars quickly scattered the enemy. The general then hastily ordered a squadron of the 10th Hussars to charge upon one fierce looking Imperial Guard square that was ahead of us. After sounding the call to attack, General Vivian, myself and the orderlies drew our swords and galloped alongside the charging squadron. Our bravely led attack was forced back by the determined Imperial Guards. They met us with a wall of bayonets and crashing volleys of musketry. We suffered losses and retreated. We had been too ambitious and paid a deadly price for it. One of the officers leading the attack was horribly killed by the French defenders when his horse was shot down among them. But the shrinking French guard squares were facing overwhelming odds and began falling back. I saw one square get broken and another melted away into the crowds of their comrades that were fleeing the battlefield. One or two other remaining squares in the distance continued in an impressive fighting retreat, retiring step by step. The squares continued to fire at those who dared to attack them. They so shot at their own panicked soldiers who tried to break through their ranks seeking protection. General Vivian had me sound a rally call. Our reserve of the German Hussars Regiment were moved to the brigade's front to continue the pursuit of the scattered French army. Fleeing south, mostly packed together along the Brussels Highway, they were abandoning all of their cannons and gun limbers. Our army moved forward into the night, 
chasing the beaten enemy, and thousands of French were surrendering, some begging for mercy. But we were cautious when they did that, as we knew that not all French soldiers who were given quarter came along peacefully. Often, they tried to escape shortly after being made prisoner, or at times, attacked their captors. At one point, some of our 18th Hussars had surrounded a very large number of French fugitives. Among them was one French guardsman, who should have surrendered in that hopeless situation for them, but in his anger over his army's loss, the man tried to bayonet the commander of my own 18th Hussars regiment, Lieutenant Colonel Murray. For this foolish act, Murray's orderly cut down the rogue, and still in a fury, he then hacked down half a dozen more of the Frenchmen next to him. One other incident troubled our general, when one of our hussars was trapped under his felt horse, and while trying to get free, he was shot in the head by a French lancer. I had no doubt, that before the next morning, there would be many other murderous acts overnight. More of our army's cavalry and infantry showed up alongside our brigade, as we advanced further into the French positions. Russians who by this time completely swarmed across the eastern half of the battlefield and were exiting the big village that they had finally conquered. I'm sure they were determined to capture Napoleon if he did not escape and lynch him from the nearest tree. They chased the French fugitives mercilessly down the highway. The luckiest ones were taken prisoner. As night came, it became difficult to distinguish friend from foe. Regiments began to break apart without order, into squadrons and platoons, and detachments became lost. Our general was informed that some of our hussars had cut down some Prussian horsemen, mistaking them for French in the darkness. Our own German hussars nearly got into a deadly clash with German dragoons from another of our brigades as night began. Only their battle cheers that were shouted out just before they charged alerted them to recognizing they were on the same side, only moments before almost coming to blows. General Vivian, had me sound our brigade's final rally call, to avoid further possibility of mistaken attacks. The Prussians took over the pursuit of the French, running them off, far from the battlefield throughout the night. All became quiet except for the constant terrible moans of the wounded. The victory cheers of our army, and the Prussians, faded away. We, who survived this bloodiest of battles, were all relieved and exhausted. Most of our men soon fell fast asleep, even while among tens of thousands of our comrades and foes, and horses, who lay in the tangled heaps of broken bodies, in the pools of mud mixed with blood, and trampled fields. The bright moonlight sky above only made the whole scene of destruction much more terrible to witness. Among the solitary figures walking carefully among the dead were soldiers' wives searching for their missing loved ones. The next morning revealed the battlefield to us, with such a sight of horrific suffering all around, as far as the eye could see. Our companion, the orderly, Brigade Major Harris, went missing the previous evening during our final charges. But his cousin, Lieutenant Wallington, of our 10th Hussars, searched the battlefield and very fortunately found him, though he was seriously injured with two wounds. His right arm had been too damaged by a musket ball, and our surgeons had to amputate it. But thanks to his cousin, he was alive. In the morning roll call, the full number of the losses of our comrades was revealed. Like every other regiment, we tended to our wounded and buried our dead. Some of our missing did return, but, the most seriously injured and those killed, would never be back. Our brigade soon left the horrible field of victory, to chase the defeated French army, back to their homeland. And this, finishes, my story. According to the John Ellis account of Goodwin's life after Waterloo, the heroic black trumpeter's story would be quite full. For his service during the Waterloo campaign, Goodwin was awarded the Waterloo Medal. 
in the years following the Waterloo campaign, and upon the subsequent ending of the occupation of France, the British army reduced its military size. In September 1821, the 18th Hussars Regiment was likewise disbanded, upon which trumpeter James Goodwin transferred to the British 4th Dragoons Regiment. The 18th Hussars commander, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Murray, noted in Goodwin's regimental status record that he has distinguished himself in action. Such a high-ranking commendation clearly indicates Goodwin undoubtedly proving himself to have been highly battle-worthy when in combat. While stationed in India with the 4th Dragoons, from 1822 to 1841, James Goodwin married Anne Julian in Kara, India, in May 1825. Goodwin was promoted trumpet major in 1836 and served in the Sindhi and Afghanistan campaign of 1838 to 1840. This service entitled him to the Guskney Medal. He was discharged as a trumpet major in March 1840 due to health problems. Goodwin was described at this time as a good and efficient soldier, seldom in hospital, trustworthy, and sober. He returned to England from India in 1841, where he settled in London. In 1848, he received the retrospectively awarded Military General Service Medal of 1793 to 1814 with clasps for the Peninsula Battles of Vittoria, Orthez, and Toulouse. When his wife, Anne Goodwin, died in 1851, he lived alone as a widower and a Chelsea out pensioner. In 1855, whilst a resident of St. Clement's Inn, he requested an increase in his pension. However, it was refused. He died in London, from old age, in October 1865. Regarding William Affleck, the black trumpeter in the British 10th Hussars, who served at Waterloo. John Ellis, tells us of his life after the battle. Affleck, was awarded, both the Waterloo Medal, and, retrospectively, years later, the Military General Service Medal for 1793 to 1814, with its clasps, for the battles of, Sargon, and Benevente, Vittoria, Orthes, and, Toulouse. A married man with children, he was discharged as a Chelsea out pensioner in 1819, and settled in London, where he found employment as a hairdresser. He died in London in 1855, and his descendants in Britain, Australia, and the USA. George Rose survived the Battle of Waterloo, but he was wounded in the right arm. He received the Waterloo Medal, and in 1817, he transferred from the 73rd Regiment to the famous 42nd Highland Infantry Regiment. He married and had children, according to meticulous research by John Ellis. As a person of color, Rose had achieved a breakthrough in the British Army by getting promoted to the rank of sergeant while serving in the 42nd. This, despite systemic racial prejudices, which typically blocked such appointments in that era. After nearly 28 years in the British Army, Rose was obliged to retire, due to complications from his Waterloo injury. Thereafter, he was awarded a decent sum of money as a Chelsea out pensioner. During the 1840s decade, Rose preached at the Waterloo Veterans Church, in Glasgow, Scotland. There, he was among friends, including a fellow veteran, and brother-in-arms, of the 73rd, John, MacDougall. Rose returned to his homeland of Jamaica in 1849, where he continued involvement in Methodist ministry activities. He died of old age in 1873. General Vivian was highly decorated for his leadership role at Waterloo and praised by the men of the regiments he had commanded. During and following his distinguished military service, Vivian was a family man. After the death of his wife Eliza, he married a second time. He was employed in various roles as a public servant, during which he tended to be more rash and less comfortable in his decision-making than when he commanded a brigade of cavalry in times of war. For decades, following the Waterloo campaign, Vivian was outspoken in his statements, which praised the decisive Prussian army's arrival, that began midway into the Battle of Waterloo. His grandson, Claude Vivian, wrote a biography, which featured General Vivian's life during his military years, in the Peninsula War and Waterloo campaign. The detailed account was based upon the General's own journals, and the many letters that he wrote to his wife, Eliza 
during his wartime exploits. Richard Hussey Vivian's biography ended with some of the last words the general wrote about his own life, just a week before he died, at the age of 67. And the purpose, for which I was sent into this world, better, than by doing all the kindness, and all the good I can, towards my fellow creatures. Thank you.